Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us for today's webinar, the ABCs of SBICs. My name is John Williams, and the slide popping up here, you'll see my colleague, who I'm very pleased to be joined with, by today, Kimmy Murakami. Uh, I'm a partner in our government contracts group, and Kimmy is counsel in our business and corporate group. And you know, today's webinar is really a great example of the symmetries between the different practice groups that we have at Polaro Maza. Uh, that, uh, and you can see as we go to the next slide uh, a little bit more about our firm. We, we have a very diverse uh, array of practice groups, uh, government contracting, and, and small business programs. I think that's probably what we're most well known for. But the business and corporate group is another leg of the stool, we like to say. And uh, the, the ways that those two practice groups work together, government contracting and business and corporate, really, I think, one of the hallmarks of our firm. And, and Kimmy and I would do a lot together with our government contracting clients when they're going through an M&A transaction or they have financing needs and you know, other corporate issues for our government contracting clients. And that's really the genesis of the presentation that we're going to give you today. And uh, today's webinar is actually kind of a second part or a follow on of a webinar that Kimmy and I did last month on financing options for government contractors. So you'll, as we move through the slides today, you'll see a link to the webinar we did last month and definitely encourage you to go back and, and listen to that webinar. We'll, we'll sort of touch on some of the concepts and options that we got into last month, but the real focal point of today's webinar is uh, SBICs. Uh, we wanted to spend a whole webinar really diving into you know, what is the SBIC program. You know, it's, it's a very unique public-private partnership, an opportunity for investment funds to be licensed by SBA and make investments in small businesses. Uh, and you know, there are unique ways that those investments are structured. There are unique advantages for small businesses in getting this investment uh, and also for the investors. And I think that's really one of the main reasons that we wanted to delve into this topic is because Kimmy here's, works a lot with venture capital funds and other uh, investors that either want to make an investment in a small business or have made an investment in a small business. And, and I end up seeing it when there's a protest filed or, you know, when the, client is being proactive, you know, up front when we're assessing eligibility for a particular program. And, you know, there are the traditional way that that, that type of investment is structured can present some real challenges for government contractors uh, in terms of affiliation issues and maintaining small business status, as we talked about in, in more detail during last month's webinar. But SBICs are really unique. If, if you're a venture capital firm, if you're an investor that creates an SBIC, you have some real unique advantages to navigate the regulatory issues that might otherwise trip you up in, in being an investor in a small business. And obviously, as the small business, then this is a, a, a great way to get capital be, and avoid some of the concerns that you might otherwise have uh, through different uh, funding means. So uh, we're really going to dive in both. Uh, Kimmy's going to start off by giving you the perspective of the, the SBIC. You know, if you're interested in, in becoming an SBIC, how do you get licensed to do that? And what are, uh, how do you structure the SBIC? And then I'm going to come in and talk about uh, the unique regulatory advantages. So We'll, we'll, and from the small businesses perspective. So I think we'll give you a good yin and yang, you know, both from the SBIC side of the aisle and from the small business side of the aisle. And then we're going to end with, and this is a teaser, and it's specifically designed to ensure you stick with us the whole time. We're going to end with some very unique rules 
for the 8A firms out there and for investors looking to make investments in 8A firms. There are some, I think, uh, often overlooked or not, not well understood advantages for SBIC investments in 8A companies. And so we're going to uh, get into those at the end. So I hope you stick around for that. And just one more bit of housekeeping before I turn it over to Kimmy. All these slides will be available to everybody uh, when the presentation's over. So, uh, you know, you'll, you'll get a copy. And, and we're also happy to answer any questions you have during the webinar. So please don't hold back. Go ahead and use the, the question box and fire away. If we can't get to it during the presentation, we'll get back to you by email afterwards. All right. And without any further ado, let me turn it over to Kimmy. Okay, thank you, John. And I do see we already have one question pop up, so let us go through the information we have to present to all of you, and uh, then we'll try and get to some of your questions. But hopefully we might address some of those uh, during the webinar today. So let us get through, and then we'll look at some of your questions uh, towards the end. So I'm going to get started with what is the SBIC program? The program was established by Congress through the Small Business Investment Company Act in 1958. So it's been in place for almost 60 years. It's a unique private-public partnership, as John mentioned, where private equity funding is government-supported. The program is a multi-billion dollar program that has provided more than $70 billion to 100,000, more than 100,000 small businesses. These are very common household names that you're familiar with, such as Apple Computer, Federal Express, Callaway Golf, Whole Foods, um, staples. So many businesses that you've heard of have benefited from the SBIC program. So what is an SBIC? An SBIC is a privately owned and managed investment fund that invests in small businesses. It's licensed and regulated by the U.S. Small Business Administration or the SBA. It has access to financing made available by the SBA, which we're going to get into more detail about. And right now, today, there are approximately 300 active SBICs that are out there. So if you're an investment fund and you want to become an SBIC, to do so, you have to get an SBIC license from the Small Business Administration. There are different types of SBICs or different types of SBIC licenses that you can get, such as an impact um, license, an early stage license or early stage SBIC, but today we're going to focus on the standard SBIC and talk mainly about first-time applicants. So to get a, uh, an SBIC license, there's an application process, and generally this process can be broken up into three phases. There's phase one, which is the preliminary step where you submit an initial application, and I'm going to go into more detail about that. Phase two is raising capital and filing your application with the SBA. And phase three is about getting your formal licensing finally approved. All of this is administered by the SBA's investment division. So the application process begins with phase one, where the funds management team will file an initial application with the SBA, which is known as the Management Assessment Questionnaire, or MAQ. The SBA reviews the MAQ, it performs preliminary due diligence, and the SBA's investment committee will meet to make an initial assessment. The SBA's target time frame for this uh, initial preliminary stage is eight weeks. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about, about some of the real-time deadlines that we're seeing right now. But as of right now, they try and get that initial review done in eight weeks. If the MAQ is received favorably, the SBA will invite the management team of the fund to make a formal presentation or to come in for an interview. Obviously a very good sign that uh, the MAQ was favorably reviewed. In phase two, we've put here green means go, because after the investment funds management team has gone in for their formal interview, there's a rigorous evaluation process ongoing at the SBA and the investment committee of the SBA will issue, if it believes minimum criteria have been met, they will issue what is known as a green light letter to the management team. With the green light letter, the management team has 18 months from the date of issuance to finish uh, its formal application 
to get all of the exhibits together and to get its application ready to submit to the SBI, SBA. At the same time with the green light letter, the management team is going out and trying to get commitments from the investors for the fund. Generally, the SBA is going to want to see private funding in the range of about $15 million to about $20 million. As well as filing the application, getting their financial commitments in place, there's also an application fee of $15,000 when the application is filed with the SBA. So after filing, we go into phase three, and this is the formal licensing. The SBA is going to assign a licensing analyst to evaluate the application. The SBA's investment committee will also be meeting to decide whether or not to recommend approval of the application. Ultimately, this final decision is going to be that of the SBA administrator. The target time for the SBA, once they receive the final application, is six months. But generally, we've been hearing from those, um, I spoke to someone who had recently gotten their uh, green light letter, and generally that we're hearing it's taking about 12 months or even over a year right now to process applications. So if you want to become an SBIC, how should it be structured? And typically, the structure will be that of a limited partnership. This is SBA's preferred structure, the one that they most commonly see and that they're familiar with. The limited partnership or the fund will have a 10-year life uh, with the first five years where they're making decisions about what to invest in and in the second five years um, in exiting those investments and making a good return or getting a good return for their investors. In a limited partnership, there are both limited partners and general partners. And so for the SBIC itself, uh, it'll be managed by the general partner, but the limited partners are the ones who will be making the investments and making the capital contributions. The general partner is generally set up as a limited liability company, and the active managers of the SBIC are the members of that general partner LLC. The general partner is the one controlling um, the operations and the budget of the SBIC. They're the ones evaluating investments and making decisions on uh, what, the, what businesses the SBIC is going to invest in and also uh, what, when to exit um, in order to get a good return. So each member of the S SBIC's management team must be very experienced fund managers. They're going to be thoroughly vetted by the SBA. The SBA, in determining whether or not to grant an SBIC license, is looking for a management team that has outstanding credentials. They have to have a proven track record of superior investment returns. These are those who are very well experienced. They have the technical ability, the managerial experience, and have a, can establish and show that they've been very successful in the other funds that they've been a part of and that they have managed before. So now we finally get to the critical part about why you would want to be an SBIC or what's the advantage of being an SBIC. So, so how are SBICs funded? How do they get their money? So as I described earlier, there are limited partners who can either be high net worth individuals who are going to make commitments to the fund, or they can be institutional investors like banks. And there are a couple advantages on reasons why a bank would want to invest in an SBIC. First, they're exempt from the Volcker Rule. Under that Volcker Rule, banks are prohibited from investing in certain kinds of covered funds. This would include private equity funds or hedge funds. But SBICs are exempt from and are not within the definition of a covered fund. So therefore, it's fine for banks to invest in SBICs and make contributions to SBICs. They're not going to be in violation of the Volcker Rule. A second reason why a bank might want to invest in an SBIC is that they are subject to certain, banks are subject to certain regulatory requirements, um, such as making investments in qualified investments as defined under the Community Reinvestment Act, or CRA. 
and SBICs do fall within the definition of a qualified investment. So a bank will get credit, a CRA credit, if they invest in an SBIC. So that's the second reason why banks sometimes want to invest or it's an advantage to invest into an SBIC. So once the SBIC has its commitments of private funds that are going to be uh, contributed by the high net worth individuals or the institutional investors like banks, that amount of private funds raised is very, very important because the SBA is going to contribute two times that amount of private funds that have been raised. So for every dollar raised in private funding that an SBIC has, the SBA is going to fund with two more dollars, thereby making three dollars total uh, for the SBIC itself to invest in small businesses. So it's a great advantage for the SBIC uh, or an investment fund to get licensed as an SBIC because then it really has so much more capital to invest in small businesses. So the funded portion that the SBA is going to contribute, this is known as leverage, and I'm not going to get too deep in the weeds about leverage and, and how we get the money in to the SBIC, but know that this is not um, just a pot of money that the SBA has sitting that uh, they're going to give out to these SBICs. Leverage is provided through the issuance of SBA debentures. So the SBICs can borrow leverage by issuing debentures. The debentures are unsecured debt instruments that are pooled together with other debentures issued by other SBIC funds and sold to underwriters in an SBA guaranteed uh, bond offering. So the offering has the full faith and credit of the government behind it, like a general obligation bond. So leveraged debentures um, have interest rates that are tied to the Treasury note, which, of course, is a very low um, interest rate, so again, very favorable. So effectively, leveraged debentures is like a 10-year unsecured loan requiring semi-annual interest. So this is the way that the SBA has these funds available for investing. An SBIC can get up to $150 million to a single SBIC fund in leverage financing. For a family of SBIC funds, uh, which is defined as two or more licenses under common control, they can get up to $350 million in leverage. By getting the leverage, the SBIC pays a fee to the SBA, which defrays the costs and any losses for the government. Um, so some SBICs may need to get some me mezzanine financing uh, to pay that annual, uh, semi-annual interest to the SBA, SBA. As well, by taking leverage, SBICs are subject to certain reporting requirements. They have to keep certain books and records, which are also subject to SBA examination. I'm sure these requirements uh, sound familiar to those of you who are listening or small businesses in the SBA socioeconomic set-aside programs because it's very similar about the reporting requirements and maintaining certain records that the SBA can come in and examine. Hey, Kimmy, I just wanted to pause you there just for a, real quick to make sure. Does everybody uh, know what mezzanine financing is? We're not getting anything back. So mezzanine, uh, a few are saying uh, no. So mezzanine financing is um, loans that are a little bit beneath, they are beneath uh, the superior or the, the first priority uh, debt that an entity has. So mezzanine financing is second in line, if you will. So what we're talking about here is that, of course, the, the loan or the financing that you're getting is um, first in line. Mezzanine financing is kind of, um, if you think about it, like uh, in second place as well. Okay, I think we're good to go on. Um, so, so far what we've been talking about is standing up uh, an, the SBIC fund. Um, getting the money in and having an SBIC itself. And now what we're going to turn to is getting the money out. How does the SBIC make investments or, um, you know, out to the small businesses? 
So if you had taken our, John and my webinar last month, we talked about raising capital uh, by small businesses. And there are different ways that an SBIC can invest in small businesses. They can make loans, uh, which are evidenced by a debt instrument. They can do equity financing, which means that they're getting part ownership back in the small business that they're investing in. This is really what got John and I very interested in this topic about SBICs, because often we have seen where private equity tries to come in and invest in a small business, and because of the regulatory restrictions for those in the set-aside programs of the SBA, there are ownership and control issues that have to be met by the individual upon whom eligibility rests, for the, depending on the kind of program that you're in, whether you're WSB, SDVSB, 8A. And so it, it's challenging sometimes for private equity to come in because they might want a seat at the table, have some control, or they want to have a greater ownership interest. And so here, as John's going to get into more as we go through this webinar and discuss SBICs, there are instances where SBICs can take some ownership and control. So um, this is what is a very interesting aspect of SBIC financing and why we wanted to talk about it uh, for the benefit of our small business clients. So there's loans that can be done, which is debt, or there can be equity financing, or there can be a combination of those two, where you have like a debt instrument, like debt securities, um, evidence, so it's a loan, but there's an option to acquire equity in the small business, or there could be um, a debt that can be converted uh, into equity in the future, so true ownership. So now I'm going to turn it back over to John, who's going to get into a little bit more about some of the other issues that small businesses need to keep in mind when getting financing. All right, great. Thanks, Kimmy. Uh, and you know, I think that was a great overview of how SBICs work. And I'm guessing that many of you listening are not too dissimilar from me in terms of like you're just learning about this for the first time, or you had some vague awareness of SBICs, but didn't really understand what they were and how they worked. And I hope that overview that Kimmy just ran through gives you a good base of knowledge for how SBICs work. And, and especially if you're on the investor side of things, how you would go about uh, forming and being licensed as an SBIC. I and mean, again, we've worked with a number of investors, venture capital firms, et cetera, and often, and they want to structure the deal in a certain way. It's typical, it's uh, commercially reasonable in, in their world to have, if not a controlling ownership stake, then at least negative control through you know, ability as a minority owner to block the majority owner from taking certain actions. I mean, those are very reasonable protections for an investor, but in the highly regulated world of small business contractors that presents a problem. And so it, it's a pretty common exercise for us to work with investors or with the small businesses that want to receive an investment to understand what are the small business ramifications of the, the investment. And in the context of those discussions, we've, as we've become more familiar with SBICs over the last couple of years, we've started to bring that up in this discussion with the investors. You know, have you explored forming an SBIC? And oftentimes the response is SBI what? And so that's really in large part behind why we're doing this to, to make sure that the investor community you know, is, is aware if you're in the small business contractor market, this really is a valuable tool. And if you're the small business, this is a great way to get an investment and, and, and with it some protections against affiliation that you wouldn't have through other types of investments. And, you know, this slide here, 17, this is really a recap of what we talked about in the last webinar in September. And, and frankly, it's probably pretty obvious to everybody, you know, you, it's small businesses are going to need to raise capital for a variety of reasons. And that, that's a no brainer. And if you follow the link here at the bottom of slide 17, you'll be able to view and, and listen to 
uh, our, our webinar from last month. So definitely encourage you to check that out while it's still available. Um, so turning to the next slide then, uh, number 18, which will be popping up here. So affiliation is a word we've been throwing out. Uh, don't want to just assume that everybody on this webinar did the last webinar and I'm fully understands what we mean by affiliation. So just a quick run through here. You know, if you're a small business contractor or you're looking to invest in a small business contractor, you need to be aware of affiliation because if affiliation exists, it has the potential to wreck the company's small business status. In other words, the company might be small on its own, but if it is considered to be affiliated with another company, then the SBA will combine the revenues of all the affiliates in determining whether a company is small. So company A might have just a couple million dollars in revenue and be small on its own, but if it's affiliated with Lockheed Martin, it's not going to be small anymore because all of Lockheed Martin's revenues are gonna come into the, d the determination of company A's small business status. And there's a variety of ways that, that affiliation can arise and most relevant for this topic are through loans themselves, you know, uh, through negative control, economic dependence, ownership changes. Affiliation is, at, at the end of the day, it's about control. Does one party have the ability to control the other? So we're, we're looking at these arrangements, you know, the terms of the loan itself and uh, the, the nature of the relationship between the companies to determine if one has the ability to control the other. And when we're talking about financing, investments, loans, et cetera, generally speaking, a traditional lender like a bank is going to carry less risk of affiliation because fortunately the SBA recognizes that no small business could go get a loan or a line of credit, et cetera, from a bank if they were going to be considered affiliated with that bank uh, because of the loan. So traditional financing, much less risk of affiliation. But when you get into investments, from non-traditional, not, not a bank. So, I mean, a venture capital fund may be a traditional lender in some sense, but I guess what, for, for our purposes here, we're really com contrasting with banks and their traditional, you know, go in and get a line of credit or open your business checking account. So third parties could be an angel investor, could be another company, could be, you know, a venture capital fund there are greater risks of affiliation in those relationships just simply because they're not banks. And then on top of that, it doesn't make it affiliation in and of itself, but it just carries a greater risk. So we have to be more mindful about how those investments are structured. And then on top of that, as I mentioned before, you know, the sort of the traditional way that these third party investors want to structure the investment create commonly creates affiliation issues and the one on your slide right here about negative control is probably the biggest one that we see that you know if, if you're not taking a controlling if you take a controlling ownership position in your investment then you there's affiliation automatic because controlling ownership means affiliation and you can't rebut that so stock ownership that's irrebuttable control in sba's eyes but if you don't have a controlling ownership position, so 49% or less of the voting stock, you could still be viewed in SBA's eyes as controlling the company if you have negative control. And so this concept of negative control is essentially that you have the right to block the majority owner from taking certain actions. Um, and that could be through the board of directors voting mechanisms, or it could be through shareholder voting mechanisms or some other means. But if there are provisions in, and you're going to see this in your operating documents, could be in the quorum provision, could be in, in voting or transfer provisions. It, if you have decisions that require approval by more than just the majority owner, then there's a, that's a negative control provision. 
Now, they're not all necessarily problematic. I mean, it, the, the SBA will permit some limited uh, protections for investors, although you really have to be careful and, and be mindful of which small business program are you talking about because some of these programs will allow a little more flexibility for minority investors than others. Uh, but generally speaking, you know, that's where you're going to find them and that's what negative control is. And that, and that's really a typical uh, aspect of third party investment. So it's, it, that's what makes it so challenging to navigate that type of an investment because the typical structure is going to create a negative control issue. And if you've got a, if you have an affiliation with a venture capital fund and that venture capital fund also controls dozens of other companies, then you can see why it would have be a problem to be affiliated with the venture capital fund because you've got a whole lot of other companies that are being lumped in together with you when SBA determines your small business status. So we want to avoid that. Another issue that um, just from a regulatory perspective to make sure we're all on the same page on the requirements is stock options. And this is another common component of third party investments uh, out, you know, outside investments, not traditional bank financing that uh, maybe the, there'll be a loan that's convertible to equity or, you know, some kind of an option to purchase additional stock is given to the minority owner investor what you need to these are common and you know they're they're from a straightforward business perspective i think very reasonable protections for the investor who's putting a lot of capital into the business and that the business really needs to succeed in most cases um but Again, we got to look at this through the eyes of the regulator, and SBA's uh, perspective is, again, to be concerned about whether this type of an arrangement, stock option, gives the minority party the ability to control the, the majority owner. And so when SBA sees a stock option, they have a rule called the present effect rule, and the present effect rule gives the SBA the ability to treat that option as if it's already been exercised. So if they're doing, just as an example, if they're going to do a size determination of your company tomorrow and you have a minority investor and that minority investor holds an option to buy a uh, certain amount of additional shares of your stock and if the minority investor exercised that option, the minority investor would become the majority owner of your company. So again, tomorrow, the investor is not the majority owner, but they hold an option to become the majority owner. If the terms of that option are not very remote, uh, you know, I like to make the joke, if the terms of the option is that uh, the nationals have to win the World Series before the investor can exercise the option, then okay, that's unfortunately looking to be pretty remote these days. So that that might not qualify. But uh, you know, if it's something relatively uh, definitive, like within a certain period of time, they just have the unilateral right to exercise that option. SBA very likely will treat that option as if it's already been exercised. So tomorrow, even though the investor simply holds an option to acquire the majority ownership and hasn't actually exercised the option, SBA could treat that option as if it's already been exercised, which means tomorrow they're going to treat the minority investor not as the minority owner, but as the majority owner. And that may have real implications for your, your size status. So as we move forward in, in some of the later discussion here, I just want to make sure we have that base of knowledge on a couple of these rules that are implicated because when we get to the end and we're talking about these special rules for 8A firms and investors that want to invest in 8A firms, there's a, there's a unique 8A rule that deals specifically with this stock option and present effect rule that I just talked about. 
So lots of scary stuff that I've been throwing out, all these problems. I keep throwing up problems for getting investments from, you know, angel investors, et cetera. But, but there's a but. If there's an affiliation exception for SBIC. I mean, this is the real home run of the SBIC program. So you take a lot of the stuff that I just talked about where we're concerned about this investor coming in and they have negative control or maybe they own a controlling interest in the investment and that's going to therefore create affiliation with all the other investments that that are held by the, the venture capital fund. Those concerns aren't on the table when we're talking about SBICs. Because as, and I've given you the quote here from the, the regulation. This is the affiliation. The SBA's affiliation rules are at 13 CFR 121-103. So the rule that we've quoted here is one of the exceptions to the affiliation rules. And you can see, you know, it's explicit right in the regs. So that this is really, really the key or one of the keys of as both an SBI as an investor and as a small business. This is the one of the main advantages of the SBIC. So it eliminates a lot of these concerns we've been talking about. The SBA has, you know, not surprisingly, a lot of regulations around the SBIC program. And uh, Kimmy talked a lot about, you know, from the perspective of the fund getting licensed, et cetera. But there are also regulations around who can receive investments from SBICs. So you have to be a small business. I mean, that's you know, the whole point of the program. So that's obvious. And there's a couple of ways that small business status is determined for purposes of SBIC investments. Those of you who are small business contractors are already well aware that your size is determined for small business contracts based on the NAICS code assigned to the contract and every NAICS code has a size standard. It's either going to be revenue based or employee based. So you, if you are a small business under the size standard for the NAICS code that covers your primary industry, then you're also a small business for purposes of SBIC investments. But there's also this financial statements test which if you happen to not be a small business in your primary industry, but if you meet the financial statements test, then you, um, you could still qualify as small for, for purposes of receiving SBIC investments. And there are some limitations. You're not every type of business can receive small business investments. So if any of the caveats on this slide apply to you, then SBIC investments you know, aren't going to be in your future insurance companies or foreign entities or firms in financial, uh, you know, or, or real estate, uh, farmland. It has to be an active business. So I'm just giving you some of the parameters here of what where SBIC investments would not be possible. Right. In, in common parlance, um, while we put here from the regulations, it says re-lenders or re-investors, mainly what we're saying here is that the, it's banks. So an SBIC cannot invest in banks or any of the other kinds um, of businesses that are listed here. And the SBA regs um, that govern SBICs can be found at 13 CFR Part 107, if anyone's really interested in reading more about some of the limitations on SBIC investments, but we tried to capture some of those here. So there are other um, terms that are set forth in the regulations about SBIC investments. Um, the term for an SBIC financing has to be between one year and cannot exceed 20 years. There are in the regulations uh, some instances where they can be for shorter, uh, short term financing of less than a year, but those are in very um, unusual circumstances and the SBA would have to approve that. There are also caps set forth um, in the regulations for the interest rate and for the fees that are charged 
again, the regulations are going towards just trying to make sure that the SBIC is not taking advantage of the small business. So the interest rate um, for providing a loan is set at, at 19% generally, um, and for debt securities at 14%. But again, they can be lower than that. The SBA regs just are providing that they don't want to exceed uh, those, those top limits. There are a lot of fees charged in getting SBIC financing, and the regulations go into a lot of details about those fees, how they're determined. They're either determined, for example, based upon the amount you might be receiving, um, just like when you're getting financing from other lenders. Um, so the regulations go into great detail about making sure that these fees are tied to how much you're getting and to make sure that they're uh, kept at a certain level. So another one of the characteristics of SBIC investments that was very interesting to John and I in putting this together, of course, was the fact that we have often seen with private equity, like John was describing, when people come in and, and want to invest in a small business, that there's a stumbling block, as we were describing, because of ownership and control regulations for those small businesses in socioeconomic set-aside programs. But for SBICs, in the regulations, it states that they can exercise control over a small business for purposes connected to the investment. This control can be exercised through ownership of voting securities, management agreements, voting trusts, majority representation on the board of directors. So all those things that we've seen in the past where when investors have come in that are not SBICs that we've said, whoa, 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 we have to make sure that we're not jeopardizing your set-aside status by giving too much control or giving too much ownership to the individual who's not the disadvantaged individual. So we have to be very careful of that when our clients come to us and want to get financing. But here we have this uh, regulation for SBICs where SBICs are allowed to have some control. Now it's for a limited time. The regulation states that the period of control cannot exceed seven years um, unless approved by the SBA under special circumstances. But again, seven years uh, sounded to us a lot better than um, having to say no and turn away an investor. So again, we thought this was a very interesting aspect of um, SBIC financing. So if you want to get SBIC financing, um, and John and I had covered some of this in our last webinar about being a small business and trying to get ready uh, to get bank ready, we were calling it, to get everything in order so that you would look like, a, have strong credit, credit worthiness. So you look like a borrower that uh, an SBIC fund would want to invest in. You want to make sure that your corporate records are all up to date, that the ownership of your uh, equity is shows very clear and clean title, that you have complete financial records, financial statements, you have a very strong management team in place. You also want to have a solid business plan, which demonstrates how the company would achieve all of its goals if it were to get an investment. Also, you want to have quality collateral. And for small business contractors, what we're talking about there is that you have a diverse portfolio of contracts. In determining your enterprise value, it's very important that you have a diversity of, of, of different kinds of government contracts so that they're not all 8A contracts, for example, or that they're not all for a particular type of set-aside program, but if possible that you have a diversity of contracts. Again, think about it when the SBIC is viewing your company and whether or not to invest. They're also thinking about getting their money out later on uh, when after they've come in, invested in your company, helped you grow and become successful. They're looking at the exit at the sale event and a company will be more valuable if you have a diverse portfolio of contracts and not just one type of contract. So now we've told you about SBICs, we've told you about some of the restrictions for getting SBIC financing, and now if you're excited about it, how do you find out about SBICs? One place to go is to the SBA website. Uh, we've provided the link there. Uh, they have a good description there about, um, and has a list of the 
I mentioned the 300 or so uh, funds that have SBIC licensing. There is also a very, very active trade association for SBICs called the Small Business Investor Alliance. And we've put the website there uh, for you to go investigate SBIA. SBIA website has a lot of very good information also um, about SBICs. And this is the, the organization that also provides training to the fund uh, when an uh, investment fund gets SBIC licensing. Uh, there's some, a day-long training that they have to go through, which is provided by the SBIA. So this is a very, very good trade association, another good place for you to go to find out information um, about SBICs and about getting financing from SBICs. So now, and, and um, I think I would huh? I would just add that uh, Kimmy's being a little bit modest here. You should call Kimmy too. We're, we're not an SBIC and we're not affiliated with a particular SBIC, but I know that in our travels, so to speak, we know many SBICs. And Kim Kimmy was mentioning one in particular that she was just meeting with. So it's not a formal part of our practice to make that type of connection. But absolutely, if we know someone in the SBIC world and we know someone that's looking to make that connection, we'd be happy to make an introduction. So I think you know, if this is something you want to explore further, in addition to the helpful links that she's given you here, I would suggest reaching out to Kimmy. Thank you. Yep. Uh, happy to help. And I'm as she... Progress. As she turns over to the next slide here, well, I'll jump in. I'm I'm going to answer a question. Um, got a question here on what impact does the new SBA mentor protege program have on SBICs? That's a really interesting question. I, I'm just going to consider and answer it in real time here, which maybe is dangerous. I haven't thought about that before, but the the questioner is alluding to this new mentor project program that's open to all small businesses. I'm sure everybody's aware of it, or if you're not, uh, let us know. We've got a webinar on that too. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a real advantage now for large businesses partnering with small businesses and getting, there's an affiliation exemption for uh, mentors and protégés. So just like I talked about earlier, that there's an exemption for SBICs. An another affiliation exemption exists for mentors and protégés that are approved by SBA. And another component of the mentor-protégé program is that the mentor can provide financial assistance to the protégé, and the mentor could own up to 40% of the protégé. So I and, and those that ownership and the financial assistance, if, it, if it's done under an SBA-approved mentor-protege relationship, will not cause affiliation. So I think in those respects, there is some overlap between some of the advantages and the ways that the SBIC program works and the mentor-protege relationship. But it and that the advantage or the the similarities. I think end there because the obviously the SBIC program is a program specifically created for these investment funds. So then the SBA facilitates the raising of funds, uh, you know, that are done privately initially, and then additional, you know, sort of matching funds facilitated through the SBA up to two or maybe three times the amount of the privately raised funds, you know, that that's just the mentor project program isn't designed for that. The mentor project program is geared more towards pairing up a specific mentor and a specific protege. It's a relationship. The mentoring program could last up to six years, uh, two, three year term. So a maximum of six years, whereas an SBIC, you know, while there are some limitations, as Kimmy mentioned, on a particular investment that it might make, it can make investments in multiple small businesses. So there are some similarities between the two, but in in, in many respects, they're they're different. So, um, all right. So as we move in, there, I saw there's another question here about ownership in an 8A company. So thanks for that question. It's perfectly timed. Um, because now we're going to talk the last few slides here about the unique advantages for SBICs and the 8A program. Um, so the there are several, and I these were some of these were surprises even to us. We don't think that 
many people realize these are in the SBA's regulations. So I spent a lot of time talking about the stock options and the problems that those can present if they're treated, uh, if they're given present effect. Well, for an 8A company, you would have the same type of issue with unexercised stock options. You can see the first part of the rule that I'm quoting you here. This is an 8A rule, and the first part of the rule says that any unexercised stock options held by non-disadvantaged individuals will be treated as exercised. So that's essentially the present effect rule for 8A companies. In, a non, in, a, in an 8A company, the majority owner has to be what SBA calls a disadvantaged individual. So if you're a non-disadvantaged individual, you can't have more than 50% ownership in an 8A company because it has to be 51% owned and controlled by disadvantaged individuals. So if non-disadvantaged individuals have stock options that are unexercised, SBA is going to treat them as if they're exercised when they decide whether disadvantaged individuals own at least 51%. Unless the stock option, the unexercised stock option is held by an SBIC. So that's a, a real advantage for SBIC investment in 8A companies that doesn't exist for other types of investors who, who might invest and want to have stock options in an 8A company. Next slide popping up here, 29, is another advantage for the 8A program and SBIC. So it, if you own, if you're a non-disadvantaged individual and you own 10% or more in one 8A company, you are restricted in how much you can own in a second 8A company, in another 8A firm. And it depends, it's either 10 the restrictions are either 10% or 20% in that other 8A company, depending on where the other 8A company is in the nine year cycle uh, for the 8A program. So, you know, generally speaking, if you're an investor, you're not going to be able to have significant investments, you know, greater than 10 or maybe 20% in multiple 8A companies. However, the 8A rules explicitly say that these limitations do not apply to SBICs. So again, the, you know, the, the purpose of the SBIC is to create this fund to make investments in multiple small businesses. And so fortunately, SBA's rules recognize that that could mean the SBIC makes investments in multiple 8A firms. And the regulations permit you know, greater investments than the typical investor would be allowed to have. And the third unique advantage here for 8A investments in 8A firms by SBICs, this is in the statute. The Small Business Act has a provision, and I've, I've quoted it in full for you here, um, which says that any potential, I mean, the real key I've underlined, that any potential ownership interest held by an SBIC, that's a, a, a company licensed under the Small Business Investment Act of 1958 is an SBIC. So any potential ownership interest held by an SBIC shall be treated in the same manner as interests held by individuals upon whom eligibility is based. So the individuals upon whom eligibility is based that's the disadvantaged person. You know, that's the 51% the owner of the business. So this is a really interesting statutory provision. I mean, and the question, uh, one of the questions we got is, does can SBICs own a controlling interest in 8A firms? And I think the answer based on the statutory provision is yes. But with the, the particular context of this statutory provision is important because this this provision comes up in the context of uh, transferring control of an 8a company from one person from the current disadvantaged owner to someone else and what happens to the 8a contracts that are being performed by that company 
if it's going to have an ownership change. So th this part of the statute says, well, you, you can't do that. The, the contracts will have to be terminated unless the SBA administrator agrees to grant a waiver that will allow these contracts and this ownership of the 8A company to transfer from one person to the next. So this is sort of this general rule that we we don't want transferring of 8A, majority 8A ownership or the contracts being, the 8A contracts they're performing from one party to the next unless SBA approves of it. But this language, so the reason this language is so important is what it's saying is SBA is generally not going to approve the transfer of ownership of an 8A firm and the 8A contracts unless it's being transferred to a new owner that is also eligible for the 8A program. And so that's the context in which this language comes up. It says that when, they're con when the SBA is considering whether to allow the transfer of ownership of an 8A company, they need to treat any potential ownership interest held by an SBIC uh, in the same manner as the individuals upon whom eligibility is based. So that really means that the a -day, an existing 8A company should be able to sell its a majority interest in its business to an SBIC, and the SBA uh, should approve of that change in ownership and the continuation of the 8A contracts being performed by the 8A firm. Now, and I, you know, we put a question mark there, and I'm saying should because this statutory language isn't directly reflected in the 8A rules, and it's unique enough that we've talked with a few people uh, with SBA or who used to be with SBA that aren't familiar with this and haven't seen it utilized in practice. So, if anybody who's listening has experiences, particularly with this language being used in a change of control of an 8A company, we'd love to hear from you. Let it drop us a, a note after the webinar. Um, but it, you know, this is coming right from the Small Business Act and it, it if put into practice, it just, it provides another advantage for both SBICs as well as 8A firms getting investments from SBICs. Yeah, that would be great if there is anybody who's familiar with this provision. Um, uh, please contact us. Probably, too, we're the only people on the planet who would be interested in hearing from you about something like this. So, yes, please uh, let us know if you're familiar with this part of the act and have um, some real life uh, that you can share with us about uh, work under this particular provision because we've been talking a lot about it. Uh, we have about a few minutes left, so I'll try and hit some of the other questions that we just received um, as well. Someone has asked, can the SBIC fund secure capital from only one limited partner? For example, if you had one high net worth individual without having to secure capital from other limited partners? Well, I mean, I think that's a great problem to have. Uh, yes, if the SBIC is structured as a limited partner, a limited partnership excuse me, if the SBIC is structured as a limited partnership, a limited partnership has to have a limited partner and a general partner. So you can have just one limited partner as long as you have a general partner as well in your limited partnership. And so if your investors are coming from one source, um, that would be fine. And that's great that you have um, that kind of individual who wants to make that type of investment. Um, I'm looking at some of the other questions somebody asked. Was yeah, I see. Oh, go ahead, I see here one. I'll jump. I'll jump in on mm -hmm. somebody asked. Going back to what do you have? What? How are you determined to be a small business for purposes of being eligible for uh, investment from an SBIC? So I had talked uh, about two different tests that the that they'll use. Either the financial statements test or the revenue employees test, which is based on your NAICS code. And the question is whether it's an either or there. And it's, it is an either or. If you meet the NAICS code test, so you, if you are small under the size standard associated with the NAICS code for your primary industry, 
then you don't need to worry about the financial statements test. It's an either or. Great. Uh, one other question was, what fees can the general partner charge for management and administration? That's a good question. Are those fees charged by the general partner have to be approved by the SBA uh, for the SBIC? And are there regulations uh, related to that? So if you're interested in that, um, I can send more information to you or give me a call and we can talk about that further. Um, I see now that we've, um, we're now at three, three o'clock, so we've reached one hour. If we didn't uh, answer your question live here today, uh, we'll, John and I will be sure to be getting back to you about your question. Yeah, thank you very much, everybody. We appreciate you participating, and feel free to contact us if you have any further questions or would like more information about SBICs. Thanks again.